Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jonathan Lee, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Director of the Harvard Brigham Virology Specialty Laboratory in Boston, Massachusetts. Today I'll be talking about viral variants and their potential impact on immunocompromised patients. So uh, right now, Omicron represents the dominant variant in the United States. However, within the Omicron variant, there are a number of subvariants. This slide shows the predominant viral variants in the US. While Omicron represents the dominant variant, it is also comprised of a number of subvariants that also will shift in proportion over time. So over the past couple of months, the BA.5 subvariant has been the dominant subspecies. But over the past few weeks, a number of new Omicron subvariants has become uh, prevalent in the US. And these include the BQ1.1 and the BQ.1 subvariant. BQ1.1 now represents about 24% of the viral population in the US and BQ.1, 20% uh, of the viral population. And both of these subvariants are increasing in frequency. You see the variants by region, as there are some differences in the prevalence of BQ.1.1 and BQ.1 in the US, with the largest prevalence in region two, um, which includes New York and its surrounding states. So as I mentioned, BQ.1.1 and BQ. Uh, one are sublineages of Omicron, and in particular, they're actually sublineages of the BA.5 subvariants. They include additional mutations outside of the spike protein. And why are we so concerned about these two subvariants? Well, one of the reasons is because some of the anti scars cov 2 monoclonal antibodies that have efficacy against other Omicron subvariants are actually not active against these two um, subvariants. In addition, in Asia, there are reports of a new XBB strain of Omicron that combines two different Omicron subvariants uh, within the BA.2 uh, family. Although in this country, the XBB strain uh, remains at a very low level. Overall, our main concern is that BQ.1 and BQ.1.1 and XBB show some of the strongest resistance to monoclonal antibody treatments and prevention. This is data from an NIH uh, website, which shows the susceptibility of tixagevimab and silgevimab, otherwise known as Evisheld, to some of these Omicron subvariants, BA.45 at the top, um, BA.5 below that, and then BA.46 in blue, BA.2.75.2 uh, in orange, and then finally the BQ and XBB subvariants in purple. And you can see for the purple subvariants on the right-hand side, um, it is primarily located on the very right-hand side um, of the graph. And a, um, the, for the graph, one represents a, a susceptibility that is similar to that of wild type, whereas a less than one number shows no reduction in susceptibility, whereas the larger the number on the right-hand side, it means that um, Evusheld is actually less active against variants. And you can see that the purple dot is on the far, far right-hand side. And this shows um, the susceptibility of beptilovimab, which is a monoclonal antibody that is FDA authorized for treatment. And again, you can see the purple circle is on the far right-hand side, showing a near 1,000-fold decrease activity of beptilovimab against the BQ1, BQ1.1, and XBB uh, subvariants. Luckily, there does not appear to be a substantial decrease in efficacy for remdesivir, nirmatrivir, or molnupiravir. This table shows a summary of all of the Omicron subvariants on the left-hand side, as well as all of the monoclonal antibodies um, that have been authorized to date, including bam eddy casarindevimab, sotrovimab, beptilovimab, and tixagevimab, silgevimab. And you can see that over time, as the Omicron subvariants have evolved, so has the resistance against each of these monoclonal antibody combinations. And unfortunately, with the BQ1 and BQ1.1 subvariants, uh, it is no longer active, um, susceptible to any of our monoclonal antibody uh, treatments or for prevention. So what are the implications for these, of these new variants for the immunocompromised patients? So when it comes to prevention, right now our only possible um, strategy is tixagevimab, silgevimab, or Evusheld. 
with the increase in resistant variants, um, it means that um, while right now there is um, many of the variants remain susceptible and the uh, most of the guidelines out there still do recommend the use of texagavimab, sugavimab, or Evusheld for prevention. Um, with the increasing rise in prevalence of these resistant subvariants, it is likely that in the coming weeks and months that Evusheld will no longer um, be effective. And individuals who receive texagavimab and silgavimab as pre-exposure prophylaxis should continue to take precautions to avoid exposure to SARS-CoV-2. And if they experience signs and symptoms consistent with COVID-19, they should be tested for infection and if, if infected, should seek medical attention. And for the treatment um, aspect, um, bebtilovimab right now is um, only recommended by the NIH when the majority of the circulating Omicron subvariants in a region are uh, susceptible. Um, and so uh, clinicians will need to uh, evaluate whether the uh, circulating variants within their particular region uh, will largely remain susceptible to this agent. But luckily for treatment, there are additional agents that are susceptible to all of the Omicron subvariants, and that includes the ritonavir-boosted nermatrivir, otherwise known as Paxlovid, remdesivir, and monupiravir. So thank you for joining me today. For more information on anti-SARS-CoV-2 molecule antibodies, please visit the series landing page at exchangecme.com. For the latest updates on COVID-19, subscribe to Exchange CME's YouTube channel and check back regularly. Thank you.